Somebody just asked me how many portraits of Elizabeth was held by the college. And the true answer is, I don't know. I think there may be three, but I've only ever seen two. And I'm sure that's true of all of you, that these are the two portraits that you have seen. Some of you will have seen them in the, in the hall, and some of them will have seen them elsewhere because they haven't always hung in the hall. Both were painted in the 1590s, and as you can see, they're very different. One is full length, rather stilted. The other one is much more intimate, and it's about half length. Uh, one of them seems to have a lot of embroidery on the, on the dress. It's very rich in jewels, the one on the left. The other one looks as if it's a bit of a more makeshift affair with, with the little bits of, of embroidery so almost stuck on the, on, on the bodice of the dress. I'll be looking at these two portraits in more detail as we go on, and the other thing that I'll be doing is setting them within the context of other Elizabethan portraits that were taking play or that were being uh, commissioned and painted around the same time and even earlier. The slide that you can see shows the hall as it is today, with the portrait, the, the full length portrait of Elizabeth dominating the presence. You can see beneath Elizabeth, who is the founder of the college, the small portrait of Hewat Price, who liked to think he was the founder of the college, but was demoted into being the benefactor. And visually, we can see the demotion in the way that the two portraits were hanged. Originally, um, this portrait, um, when it was acquired by the hall, and I'll be saying something a bit more about that in a minute, um, it, it was also put up in, in the hall. But for some reason, it was moved to the fellow's library. And it only returned to the hall um, in the early 1990s, so that when some of you were actually at Jesus, you wouldn't have seen it in this particular place. It would have been the other portrait that I showed that would have been hang there. I'll explain shortly why the substitution was made. This full length portrait of Elizabeth was donated to the hall in 1686 during the reign of James II. The donor of the portrait was the brother of Judge Jeffreys, who some of you may have heard of, you know, bloody Judge Jeffreys. That's not a term of abuse, that's a description of him, because he was responsible for the bloody assizes, um, where those who participated in the Monmouth Rebellion were uh, sentenced in large part to death. So it was Canon Jeffreys, not Judge Jeffreys, who was an alumnus of Jesus, who donated the portrait in 1686. The hall was obviously delighted with the donation, except for the fact that they didn't actually like the portrait very much. And so they handed it over to the mayor, who was the sergeant painter in Oxford at the time. And they made a payment to him, John Taylor, for a gilt frame, but in addition to that, for beautifying our foundress's portrait. And the grandson, of four pounds was paid over for that. Now the beautification I've tried to show you in a number of ways. The portrait, as I've said, was painted around 1590. And of course, at that time, the angels crowning Elizabeth, would, would, they would not have been there. Uh, that extract is an addition that was made almost certainly in 1686, together with the inscription at the bottom of the portrait. The inscription, which I won't read to you because my Latin is not terribly good, uh, does draw at a uh, highlights rather uh, certain elements of Elizabeth that became very much part of the myth associated with her after her death. She was a Virgo, she was a virgin queen. She was Caesaria, she was all like a, a Caesar. Um, she was an in, in, in sort of an emperor. Um, the empire, of course, began to be developed after Elizabeth was dead. Uh, she was Fidei Christiani. She was of the Christian faith. She was a Protestant queen. And finally, of course, and most importantly, she was the founder of Jesus College. Um, let's just have a look now at some other parts of the portrait. Um, first of all, that addition. The addition um, of the 
as it were, crowning of Elizabeth was quite common in representations of Elizabeth after her death. And some of you may associate the, this kind of crowning of the Virgin Queen with the assumption or the crowning of the Virgin Mary. Now, during Elizabeth's own lifetime, and I'll be saying again something a bit more about this, I don't think we do see a parallel being drawn between Elizabeth mm -hmm. and the Virgin Mary. But after her death, there were parallels drawn. Why was that? Well, it was the coincidence, not just of her birthday, but as also of her death, the date of her death. She was born on the 7th of September, which was the eve of the Feast of the Virgin Mary. And then coincidentally, though of course at the time people thought providentially, she died on the 24th of March, which was the eve of Mary's Annunciation. So actually from the moment of her death, Elizabeth begins to be associated with the Virgin Mary, what surprisingly, since England was, of course, a Protestant country, and it didn't in any way uh, recognize uh, uh, the intercessory status of the Virgin Mary. But after her death, it, it, it became more common. And of course, in 1586, there is a Catholic, James II, on the throne of uh, England. And to have the assumption um, motif for Elizabeth would not therefore have seen in any way strange. Another picture of Elizabeth showing her in this rather uh, assumptive way, though it doesn't have her being crowned, is the picture, is the drawing at the bottom, which has a, a halo around her head. It's by Francis Delorum, and it becomes a, a very famous um, drawing because it is the frontispiece of the first biography of Elizabeth I by William Camden. And then we see more closely associated with our portrait of Elizabeth, a portrait um, that hangs in Corsham Court today. Uh, that portrait we can see has a crown um, being placed on Elizabeth's death or after her death, and we can see um, the figure of Father Time and the skeleton. So it's quite clear that this portrait uh, was not painted during her lifetime. The dress, which is, is not an addition, um, was one that contains various motifs that could be said to be associated with the Virgin Mary, in particular the rose, and the star, which you can see on, on the dress. I don't think I need to, to point it out to you, but there's the star and the roses are along here. Okay. So the roses associated with Mary long time because she was seen as the rose without thorn. This was associated um, with Marian iconography that she was uh, born um, also without sin. Um, with the Immaculate Conception of her mother. Uh, the idea of, of Mary uh, as, as being a star came from the Stella Maris Association, which was made originally, I think, by Jerome and is thought to have been a mistranslation of the Hebrew at the time. Whether that's true or not, nevertheless, from the medieval period onwards, Elizabeth became Stella Maris, the star of the sea. Um, and associated in that way with the, even with the North Star. So when we see stars and um, roses on Elizabeth's dress, it, it's easy to make the assumption that Elizabeth is being associated with the Virgin Mary. And some of you may have seen the film, um, the first film by Kapoor of Elizabeth I, where at the end of the film, after she's suffered all these rebellions and plots and conspiracies, she kneels down before a statute statue of the Virgin Mary and takes inspiration from her and becomes the Virgin Queen. And then she emerges as if she's just walked out of the Armada portrait, which we will be seeing a little later. But that, that association is something that for a long time, art historians, uh, Francis Yates, Roy Strong, made about the iconography of Elizabeth. And it's only recently that historians have using works of literature have joined together with their English scholars and recognize that this really is a very unlikely assumption that the star 
and the rose, as well as other elements associated with the Virgin Mary, had other meanings at the time and were much more likely to be used in relation to Elizabeth. So if we take for the, the rose first, most obviously the rose is dynastic. The rose for Elizabeth represented the Tudor dynasty. Sometimes she had a white rose, which would be associated with her grandmother, Elizabeth of York. Here in this portrait, the red rose, which went back to the Lancastrian line. You see portrait after portrait of Tudors, not just Elizabeth, but Mary, her married half-sister, Henry, Henry VII, all of them with roses, and it's unquestionably a very important dynastic emblem. Elizabeth doesn't need to have a crown or carry a scepter or an orb in her hand. All she needs are roses uh, on, her, on her clothes, and everybody knows who she is. As for the star, the star has lots and lots of different associations. One of them is associated with, with chastity. Um, it was idealized beauty, chastity, and it was used, for example, in Petrarch's poetry when he's referring to his beloved uh, chaste woman, um, Laura. Um, and it's also been associated with Elizabeth specifically in poetry where it has both a Protestant connotation uh, and also one that is imperial in that she is um, a Protestant who is guiding the way as a star or guide people through the night. Um, that it says in one of the, um, one of the uh, poems about Elizabeth that she is the star of the north in contrast to the dark places of the south. The north is, of course, Protestant. The south is dark in its Catholicism. So these are far more associations that we expect to see in relation to Elizabeth and in relation to the imagery that we see in a whole range of portraits and literature um, that presents her as, in particular, a Protestant heroine. Now, one of the most interesting parts of this portrait is, is on this side, uh, where you can see the emblem, which has been described as a mermaid, but I would say is an emblem that's representing the prow of a ship. It's the same emblem that appears in the Armada portrait, the very famous Armada portrait of indeed where there are many, more than one. And the question that we need to know, which we don't know yet, is whether or not this prow was added to the portrait at the time when it was beautified or whether it was in the original portrait. And we can only find that out when there is an analysis done of the portrait, which may happen when we get the money to do it. Uh, but, you know, there are other things that I think come higher on the list of what, what needs to be done at Jesus. So what is the meaning of this prow and, 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 and why would it be in the portrait? Well, it's very clear that in the Armada portrait, it represents sea power, that the, there is also a clear line between the prow of the ship and the imperial crown um, that is on Elizabeth's other side, um, representing this is imperial power. It's an imperial crown. It is not the kind of cracker crown that you get, uh, which is the open crown, getting a cracker. That's not an imperial crown. And you increasingly see during this period, Elizabeth is represented with an imperial crown. It's much more powerful. Um, statement of royal power. And of course, in the background, we see the success of England's imperial power and its, um, and its sea power with the defeat of the Armada. And Elizabeth's hand, the one that's not holding the fan, has her, uh, her hand on the globe, but not just the globe, suggesting that she has total imperial power, but on the part of the globe, which at that time was being ruled by Spain. It's the imperial power of Spain that she is appropriating. Now, why this particular element should have been introduced in our Jesus portrait is, is really anyone's guess. Um, if it was done at the time, 
I would argue that it, this is another reason why I do not think this portrait um, is actually by Nicholas Hilliard. We'll come on to that shortly because the question has been raised as to whether or whether or not it is. If it was introduced in 1686, it may have an entirely different meaning, but at the moment we're in the dark, and so we have to move on. Roy Strong, when he was making his point that this portrait was an extremely important portrait, and that it was almost certainly by Hilliard's workshop, um, if not Hilliard himself, um, wanted to draw attention to other types of portraits that were similar to the one of Elizabeth. And let me just explain here and give the background that it was in when the portrait, the Jesus portrait, was um, going to be restored um, that the, uh, the Roy Strong took a look at it. And it was at that time that he said, this is a very important portrait. This is not just a faded, you know, 17th century portrait or whatever. This is clearly a portrait of the 1590s. And in his view, it was a Hilliard or Hilliard workshop. And it was for that reason, the portrait was taken down from the fellow's library and moved center stage to the hall. Uh, and that's why the insurance for the painting shot up astronomically. Um, so which were the paintings that um, are similar and which, which created the sense that this was uh, probably a Hilliard workshop uh, author or painter? Well, the most important one is the one in the middle, which is actually a very small portrait, much smaller than the one that we have at Jesus. It's in Hardwick Hall, and it is certainly by Roland Lockie, who did spend time in the Hilliard workshop. So we can see huge similarities there. I mean, it's um, the way uh, that Elizabeth is standing, that her dress is, is very elaborate, that she has one hand on the table, that she's holding a fan. Um, in many ways, I would say, this is another reason why I don't think it's a Hilliard, because Hilliard is so much more imaginative than to keep, you know, as it were, churning out the same sort of portrait. This is, you know, a very workmanlike approach, but they will stay quiet on that one for the moment. And this is the portrait, the, the other portrait over here, uh, which was also uh, seen as being um, part of the type, which is at present in Trinity College, Cambridge. And again, we can see some of the similarities. There is a throne in the background. There isn't the prow but there is something that looks rather similar, elaborate, um, on Elizabeth's left-hand side, so which could be seen as being similar. So the fa fan is again in the left hand, Elizabeth's hand in this one is not on a glove or on a miniature in the other two, it's on a book, but very similar in style and in pose. <coughs> So let's just take a quick look at some of Nicholas Hilliard's portraits. The first thing to note about them is that unless they've been cut, and nobody I've read suggests that they have, they're not full length and, and of, of um, human size. You know, Hilliard, of course, is, is best known for his miniatures, but he did do some portraits, and the most famous ones we can see here are of the pelican portrait and the phoenix portrait. Um, the pelican portrait, which is over here, uh, and I've just magnified the pelican that you, you can see there, is um, a portrait which uses that emblem, again, I think, to signify uh, Elizabeth's self-sacrifice as a queen just as a pelican sacrifices herself by pecking her breast and feeding the young with the, the blood of her breast. So Elizabeth has sacrificed herself, possibly by not marrying, possibly um, by being exposed to one plot after another plot and a rebellion, an excommunication, all for the good of her country. And in the second portrait of um, by Hilliard, we have the um, phoenix, 
Now the phoenix has been an emblem that's been used by monarchs many times and it has different meanings in different contexts. The meaning usually in relation to a monarch is that the monarch is unique, just as there's only one phoenix, so there is only one of this kind of monarch. And this monarch, just as a phoenix can only be replaced by another phoenix, and there's only one at a time, so the monarch can only be replaced by another monarch, and there's only one at a time. So it's very much um, a, an emblem that we associate with hereditary monarchy. However, it can also be associated with Elizabeth in, in two other ways. One way I'm not so sure about, but I will mention it to you anyway, and that is the idea of virginity, that Elizabeth is not going to have a child of her own body, and consequently, the succession will be brought about some other way. But the other way, which I'm rather partial to, I can explain why afterwards, is that it's, it's an emblem for Protestantism, um, that just as under Mary, the Protestants and the, the, the Protestant church was burnt, literally burnt, uh, to nothingness, so it came alive again under Elizabeth. And the reason I'm very fond of that particular um, idea about the emblem, because it's, it's not written down as such, um, is that quite often you see the two emblems together on Elizabeth's, uh, on, on engravings of Elizabeth, where they are both associated with Elizabeth at the same time. And it seems to me that it, they become Protestant uh, images of, of the Queen. I thought I'd just show you one very recent um, similar portrait by Hilliard. It's just been discovered at Waddesdon. It shows how portraits are being discovered. Um, you know, again, we may find the one at Jesus. Uh, anyway, there is a blog about this particular one. And once again, we can see that um, in that particular pelican portrait, if you look here, just by the pelican, uh, underneath, there's a fleur de lis. And that, I think, again, fits in with my notion that this is not about virginity. Because at the time when this painting, mid-1570s, when it was being uh, composed and painted, it was a time when Elizabeth was having negotiations for a marriage with the French prince. So it doesn't seem with that insertion of the fleur de lis to be suggesting that Elizabeth is going to be the Virgin Queen forever and today. So now we move on to the second portrait of Elizabeth. The portrait was painted um, a, probably 1590. It says so at the top, so let's take that as accurate. Uh, we have to be terribly careful when we talk about portraits for example, I learned that Philip Maud, who is a very, a very um, well-known and highly respected um, art dealer, he suggested that this wasn't Elizabeth at all. Um, I wasn't there when he suggested it, so I don't know what his, his evidence was, but to my mind, it's hard to argue that it isn't Elizabeth. Um, it's not just that her hair is red. I, I think the shape of the face is, is, is very, very like other representations of Elizabeth. The fact that, of course, she was an older woman um, in her late 50s in 1590 doesn't mean anything at all that this looks like a young woman because there was what was called the mask of youth, uh, the face pattern where Elizabeth would be shown as if she was a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old, not a woman in her 50s, 60s, and eventually 70. So that doesn't lead me to think it isn't Elizabeth, but there may be some other good reasons. One other point you might note, um, in, as my piece of evidence anyway, that it is Elizabeth, uh, and we can see it when we go right back at the, to the first portrait, is that the ring on Elizabeth's hands is in exactly the same ring that she wears in the Jesus portrait, the long Jesus portrait. So it seems to me that these two Women are the same, but we move on. 
What is noticeable about this portrait is the cherry in the ear. It's sometimes known as the cherry portrait. There's a double cherry in Elizabeth's ear. But in addition to the cherry in her ear, on her bodice, as I said before, it looks as if there are various bits of embroidery stuck on um, that represent different flowers or fruits. So if you can see that she has in her ruff, in the top portrait, you have a pansy. Can you see that? I'm not going to try. <laughs> it's fairly pointless. I hope you can see that. And then in this one here, we have a strawberry. And in her hand, it's not terribly clear, but at the top, it is actually a thistle. Okay. So there are just some examples of the, the, the fruits and flowers that are associated with Elizabeth on in this, in this portrait. Now, once again, um, a link has been made between the fruit, or certainly one of the fruits, and the Virgin Mary, uh, or Mary and iconography, and that's the cherry. Um, that the cherry has been associated uh, with Christ's passion and therefore with the mother of Christ. And maybe that's why um, it's in that portrait, if you take the Kapoor film approach, that might be a reason why she has cherries in her ear. On the other hand, cherries in mythological times um, were believed to contain um, an alexia, which gave gods immortality, and that there is a strong div divinity associated um, with the cherry. And of course, through common parlance, and I'm pretty sure the common parlance was, um, was there at, in the Elizabethan period, that cherries were also associated with virginity. So it could be that, um, that the cherry is making reference to Elizabeth in 1590 um, as, a, um, as a virgin queen. Who knows? What about the pansy? Well, Elizabeth has been associated with pansies since she was a child. Um, it was said to be her favorite flower. Um, but there's also a pun on the word pansy with pensée. Um, and uh, it reflects, it, it gives her the sense of, of being meditative and reflective. Uh, and also, of course, she, she did write a translation of a work which was in French, pensée. So it's drawing attention to, to Elizabeth's inner life um, through, through that flower. Um, if we look at the strawberry, it has many meanings, uh, but one of them is because it's a low down fruit, it's seen as representing uh, humility, um, the lack of arrogance, it's not trying to take over. Um, and although I haven't shown you this, we'll look back on the previous one, you may note that in Elizabeth's hair, in her headdress, she has a fern. Yes. Uh, and the fern, too, is um, an emblem very often of um, modesty or humility because it hides its beauty in the forest. So these flowers can have a range of associations. And Many scholars have spent time trying to make links with written records to see what they might have meant. So I'm just going to give you two examples. One is um, Maria Haywood, who's done a lot of work on uh, Henry VIII, actually. And she drew an association with these flowers with medical works, works on, on uh, medicine and herbs um, that were out at the time and what the kinds of meanings they had. <coughs> well, the argument she puts forward is that they, would, they were all attempts to stave off Elizabeth's mortality and her age. And some of them are actually quite personal to her. So for example, strawberries were supposed to be very good for the gums. And one of the things that people knew about Elizabeth was that she had this severe toothache if she had any teeth at all by the 1590s. So uh, it could be seen as some kind of personal medicinal aid that she's associated with the strawberry. 
So that's one way in which um, we find that scholars have, have tried to link the um, Elizabeth with the, these flowers. Another is, and this is from a literary scholar, and I, I'm inclined to go with it, uh, particularly Helen Hackett, is that these flowers can be seen on other works of Elizabeth, notably uh, the rainbow portrait, that she's frequently shown uh, with flowers. And in poetry, she is associated with being the queen of flowers and the goddess Astraea, um, a virginal goddess who is supposed to bring in a golden age and that Elizabeth, by being associated with flowers, can be thought of as having that power of the goddess Astraea. You pay your money, you take your pick. I don't know, but I do think there is one thing I haven't mentioned here that is of interest. And that is the thistle. The thistle, it seems to me, um, was quite a dangerous um, item to put in Elizabeth's hand during this period in the 1590s. Now, the thistle certainly stood for monarchy. Um, the reason is the head of the thistle looks a bit like a crown, okay? So it's very often a symbol for a monarch. Of course, the most well-known monarchy that is associated with the thistle is Scotland. Now, in 1590, Elizabeth did not want to name her successor. And the person who was waiting in the wings, who was determined to be Elizabeth's successor, was James VI of Scotland, who eventually, of course, does become Elizabeth's successor as James I. So, Having, if this was painted in 1590, and this is another example of how we need to check whether this is an overpaint um, at some time later when, say, James VI was on the throne of Scotland, but having someone painting Elizabeth holding a thistle, it would be very hard for people not to read into that that Elizabeth is, in a sense, anointing James or naming James as her successor. Quite a risky thing to do, I think. Okay, so there's the two portraits of Elizabeth, and I'll say something more uh, if you ask me some questions about them. But let's look at some other portraits of Elizabeth and see how they fit in with that. The earliest type of portrait of Elizabeth was this one. Um, it was, there are, several copies of it of different shapes and sizes. It was cut down um, during the 1560s. It was a, a sign of loyalty to have a, a portrait of Elizabeth in your home, in your college, in your town hall, anywhere. And these were being churned out. They're not very good. Um, how would you know that it was Elizabeth in that particular portrait? Uh, there's one giveaway, and I've highlighted it, which is the necklace that she's wearing. It is a necklace that was associated with the crown jewels. Henry VIII wore it, and um, just by wearing it, she is making clear that she is the rightful heir to the throne uh, for those who are in the know. So it's not surprising that uh, Around 1562-63, Catherine de' Medici um, of France, who knew a thing or two about self-representation, said to the English ambassador, you know, your queen needs to get a new portraitist. And the advice was taken. And initially, the kinds of portraits that were being produced were of a what we would call a Netherlandish style. And I've chosen this one here. It's, again, it's quite a recent portrait uh, in the sense that it's recently been found. It was, it was produced around 1564. But what's interesting about this portrait is twofold. One is it's a very early, probably the earliest full-length portrait of Elizabeth. But secondly, it demonstrates that in the early part of Elizabeth's reign, at any rate, Elizabeth was being presented as a marriageable queen. 
Um, this notion that Elizabeth was somehow a virgin queen from day one, or even before she became a queen, and that she had you know, taken an oath never to marry, and she knew she could never marry and contain power, I would argue, is far from reality. And this portrait is perhaps another example of how this is, it just doesn't fit with what we know about Elizabeth. I have blown up on this side the background to the portrait. And what's interesting there is that you have flowers and fruits, some of them open, in, most of them in pairs, which imply fertility. Um, and fertility, of course, in the 16th century is associated with marriage. So Elizabeth in this portrait, um, and it's clear that Elizabeth was the commissioner of the portrait, which it does not always happen, um, that she was presenting herself as a queen who would marry um, within the near future. Let's turn to the older portraits of Elizabeth. And I've chosen these two for particular reasons. The one on the far side is a portrait um, that was painted in 1579. And I have argued in, in, in one, of my, one of my books, and I still stand by it, um, that 1579-ish was a pretty much a turning point in the representation of Elizabeth. Before that time, Elizabeth was presented as a marriageable queen. After that time, or during that time, she began to be presented as a virgin queen. I'll show the virginity in a minute, but let me just explain why. In 1579, Elizabeth was considering marrying. Um, whether it was to have a child or not is, 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 is a it's neither here nor there, but she was planning to marry a French Catholic or wanted to marry a French Catholic. And there was a lot of opposition to that particular marriage. And both in masks and in portraiture, we start seeing Elizabeth being represented as a powerful virgin queen. And that that virginity operated not just as a characteristic of Elizabeth, but as a way that Elizabeth's power could prevent England becoming invaded by male Catholic rulers. Uh, and virginity thus became a metaphor for England's strengths as well as Elizabeth's strengths. So just let's have a look here and see how does that work in this portrait. Well, it works through the sieve. And again, one of the ways that one should look at portraits is how things objects in a portrait are juxtaposed. And again, if you look at a direct line uh, with the sieve, you get a globe, you get empire. So uh, the sieve represents virginity, I'll explain why in a minute, and it is linked visually with empire. So why is a sieve representing virginity? The answer really is associated with the story that was repeated in Petrarch, his, his a poem on chastity, but went back way before that, about a vestal virgin whose name was Tucha, who had mm -hmm. been accused of not keeping to her vows of celibacy. And in order to prove that, yes, she was a virgin, she took a sieve, went to the river Tiber, filled the sieve with water, the holes closed, and she was able to carry the sieve to the temple. So the closure of the holes in the sieve were representations of virginity. And we find in this period between 1579 and 1581, nearly a half a dozen portraits of Elizabeth holding a sieve. The last portrait I'm going to take you through briefly is a very well-known portrait. It's in the National Portrait Gallery, and it is a full-length portrait, also produced around the time of the one that we have here in Elizabeth, but it hasn't been touched up. It's been cut down. This bit here uh, has been cut off. There was a whole poem that runs across, so we know that the painting has been cut. This is called the Ditchley Portrait. It's a portrait, and this is 
again important to emphasize, that was not commissioned by Elizabeth. When we are talking about uh, the representation of Elizabeth, the representation is sometimes Elizabeth's choice, but is very often the choice that's made by the patron of the painting, who is usually a man. And in this particular portrait, the man is Sir Henry Lee. He was Elizabeth's champion in tournaments, and he used this portrait to commemorate Elizabeth's visit to his house. You know, we all now have photographs if somebody comes and visits our house who's important, or if you're meeting someone important at an event. I'm not asking you to think in terms of me in this case. But you know, if you meet the Pope or you meet the Queen or something, we commemorate it through some kind of portrait. What he did was have this portrait commemorated. And how would people know that the Elizabeth here uh, had paid him the honor of visiting his house? Well, if you look, at the map, Elizabeth's feet are on Oxfordshire <laughs> and on a particular place in Oxfordshire called Ditchley. This is why it's called the Ditchley Portrait. And guess who owned Ditchley? <laughs> so this portrait of Elizabeth uh, is one that has a lot of uh, emblems associated with it. Uh, but above all else, it's a portrait that's designed to bring um, prestige to the patron as much as to show loyalty to the queen. The last point I'll make about this portrait is that, of course, that you have Elizabeth controlling the weather. And you get this in quite a lot of portraits post-1588, because the myth went, of course, that God was working the weather through Elizabeth to bring about the, uh, the defeat of the Spanish Armada. So that's all I really want to say about the portraits. I'm very happy to answer questions, but I think it, what I am saying does raise issues about that we need to know more about the Jesus portraits. They are very interesting. They carry a lot of emblems with them, but it would be wonderful to know just what was overpainted just what the timing was. So if there are any donors among you, I won't say no. <laughs> Thank you.